Thanks for tuning in to Happy Horror Time. Before we get started, we're going to play a promo from one of our favorite movie review podcasts. It's called Movies That Made Us Gay, hosted by Scott and Pete. We love this podcast. It's always a good time, and we think you'll love it, too. Hi, my name's Pete. And I'm Scott. And we host the podcast Movies Movies That Made Us Gay. Gay. We're the type of kid who preferred watching movies like Romeo and Michelle and Steel Magnolias when the other boys were watching movies like Rambo. Did Batman and Robin's anatomically correct suits make you feel a certain type of way? Did you have a vision board of Nicole Kidman's wigs on your bedroom wall? If any of these sound familiar, then this is the podcast for you. At Movies That Made Us Gay, we take a look at the movies from our past that shaped our queer little lives and turned us into the well-rounded homos you hear before you. We cover all genres of movies like buddy comedies, horror movies, and erotic thrillers with fun hot takes like episode 52 on The Mummy. Rachel Weisz. Who is serving face. Super fierce. She is serving face. She's walking the face category, and she may be snatching. I mean, if Rachel's walking the face category, Patricia Vasquez as Anaxuna Moon is definitely walking the body category. Yes, Patricia Vasquez is serving body. She is, like, doing the five elements of Vogue as she's walking down that golden hallway. She's posing the house down when she's, like... In nothing but body paint. she's leaning on, like, the on the statue when, when the, the kid, pharaoh walks the in. the little kitty cat. Listen to Movies That Made Us Gay on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Hello and welcome to Happy Horror Time Podcast. My name is Tim Murdoch. And my name is Matt Emmert. And we have a treat for you Friday the 13th Part 5 fans today. We are here with the final girl and survivor of a new beginning. A talented actress, dancer, and just a really good friend. That's a fr- good friend of ours. I love We're- Melanie. Yes, Melanie Kinnaman, everyone. <laughs> Hi, everyone. God, Hi, you Melanie. Look- we are so grateful to have you here with us. How has your 2021 been so far? It's better than 2020, yes. but it started a strange week, didn't it? So I've got my fingers crossed. For yeah. 21. Yes. Fingers crossed. I mean, we can't get much worse. So let's hope no. that things. <laughs> but but ne- never say, you know, I said, oh, 2021 has to be so much better than 2020 because what could be worse and i learned don't ever say that oh yeah actually don't you're right it, it so always we should, just, we should just say we're optimistic for the future yes i like yeah. that we are optimistic for the future and part of that future involves this interview with you which we are so excited to um talk to you about i mean so we we kind of wanted to start to taking it back before you were in friday the 13th part five and just you know, what was, were you always interested in becoming an actress or what was life like for Melanie growing up? (laughs) Yes. Well, I I grew up in a small town in Massachusetts, but my goal was to get to Mecca, which was New York City. And Mm -hmm. I studied in the small town. I always wanted to be a dancer. So I started dancing at four and a singer. And so I parlayed and I was, uh, I had natural talent for dancing. So that propelled me to keep at it. And I started doing professional shows around 13 years old. Uh, I would go, my mother would take me in and I'd perform in Hartford, Connecticut, and then New Haven, and then made myself all the way to New York. I made it so, um, and I did that all through my teens. And then as soon as I graduated from high school, I went to New York City and uh, went to college for a year and a half and got successful in show business and in theater. So I left college. I don't tell people to do that, but it worked (laughs) for me. It worked for me. Yeah, you did. did, I'm not suggesting you leave college. I'm just saying I weighed what was working for me. And I thought, okay, I need to grab the bull by the horns. I'm being offered parts and plays and uh, school was in the way. (laughs) So. (laughs) You, yeah, I had read that you had done theater in New York City. What, yeah. what was your favorite show that you did? And do you miss it? Do you miss theater? I miss it a lot. I miss it a lot because there isn't as much theater in L.A. Um, oh, yeah. There was when I first got here in the 80s. They were trying to have a New York kind of theater district on Santa Monica Boulevard. If yeah, anyone it's still there. Los Angeles. It's still there, but it was really booming in the 80s. Yeah. Mm. So I got to do a lot of that. And uh, sadly, a lot of those theaters are gone. Um, 
there are some new ones. There are some new ones, but um, so, but while I was doing theater in LA, agents were coming out and uh, I was meeting, agents were seeing my work on stage. So I was able to get agents in LA and that led into some television and then some features. So, yeah, I saw that you did an episode of General Hospital. Is that correct? I did General Hospital for about six months. I was. Oh, awesome. yeah, yeah, yeah. I was killed off, but I was brought on. I was supposed to be just on for, I think, six weeks or it was this odd character that was involved with the Cassidines in the in the, um, the drug cartel and all that. So I played a German spy. <laughs> and and um, and so I, I, they, they killed me off eventually. I, I lasted a lot longer than I was supposed to because it was a really, as they say, a front burner storyline, Luke and Laura and all that. Yeah. So I was involved in that. And I think that's why I lasted so long. Um, they ended up killing me in a deep freezer. I became a human popsicle. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, my first question. I have so many questions, even though I want to get to Friday the 13th, but were, did you do an accent? Did they force you to do an yes, accent? Yes, I did the- an accent. Don't ask me to do it now because I'm out of practice. Ah, it was but, not. But I, I can, hate when people see, get my, the spot. My, my fam were German. I'm half German, half Czech. My mother was full Czech, Czech Slovak Czech, and my father was um, German. My father's passed away. Mm-hmm. They're both passed away, actually. My mother died during the pandemic, not of COVID. She was uh, 94. And sadly, she died last April during the pandemic, and we were not allowed to go. And, so sorry. Uh, yeah. So um, that's why I'm talking about them in past tense. But yeah. so I I grew up with the German people around me and the accent. So I'm a really good par- a parrot. I can, if I have to do an accent, I can learn it pretty quickly, but I have to practice it. So yes, I did do an accent in that. Um, <laughs> And Melanie, Melanie, I love soaps and we still talk about the bold and the beautiful. I mean, are you still I know. watching right now? No, I stopped because they started to really piss me off. So, <laughs> You're going to break Tim's is, heart. Yeah, I know. That's why I haven't talked to Tim about it. The storyline has gotten so ridiculous. I'm so tired of people I really liked. So <laughs> well, I don't the, watch. The I don't watch. Steffi, um, uh, Can't stand oh, Steffi oh, anymore. Can't stand Hope anymore. She should die. Oh uh, my God, I love her. I know, Tim I know. Was- Can't stand her. She needs to keel over. Uh, <laughs> I used to love, um, why can't I think of his name? The uh, Liam? No, I can't stand Liam either. He's a boy. Uh, 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 Katie's husband? Uh, no, the old guy. Of course, I like the old guy. Not oh, the old Eric. guy. No, no, Eric? no. No, uh, uh, why can't I think of his name? Oh, the, um, the, the, um, the hot one. one. Um, Bill Spencer? No. Oh I have no idea. By the way, I have no Ridge. idea. Ridge, 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 Ridge. Yes. the new Ridge. I hated the old Ridge, by the way. Oh, I remember we had the same agent. But the new Ridge, who's really German, by the way, uh, his American accent is great. I loved him. Cute. I loved him. I loved him. And now he's annoying. No, he's he huh. treats everyone like garbage, but I think he's still handsome. He's handsome. <laughs> um, but I, I think that he's just gotten really annoying ever since he married that woman in Vegas. Who I can't oh, uh, stand. Denise Richards, Shauna. Yeah, who, who I can't stand. Uh, <laughs> by, by the way, for listeners, I have no idea what either of them are talking about. Listen. I've uh, Tim is actually Melody. It's funny. Tim, so I'm not really a soap opera fan. I, I apologize, Tim. But Tim has put it. on Bold and the Beautiful a couple times when I'm there. And I just what I think is the funniest part of soap operas is that like the they end every scene with like a zoom uh, in and the person's uh, just like uh, looking and staring. Yeah. And I just imagine what if real life was like that and we talked to each other and then just like <laughs> looked at each They're other filming movies <laughs> they they film like five episodes in a short amount of time it's so- a very hard schedule i can tell you that yeah like- general <laughs> hospital i worked 18 hours a day and i wasn't even the lead character like uh, you, very do you have, very hard um, do you have a photographic memory i mean like can you pick up your lines really quick yes yes and they would change the lines literally but just before you walked on to do the scene, sometimes they'd go, oh, you know what? This works better. And it would be a page, a whole page, not a couple lines. So yes, you have to be very sharp. These actresses and actors work very hard for their wow. money on those shows. They're very difficult and you don't have much of a life outside of there. By and the way, I you two guys, wonderful. you two guys, 
are starting 2021 very handsomely. Oh, well, why, thank unbelievably you. Unbelievably handsome. You could be on Bold and the Beautiful. <laughs> oh, my God. You heard it here, Happy Horror Melanie Time listeners. My ear. Melanie just told us we look great, so that means it's a fact, and it's true. Thank you so much. That's very sweet of you to they say. They blow um, Liam away. Oh, oh, wow. Um, um, Matt has no idea who Liam is. I but don't know, okay. but he, I'm sure he's hot. Um, I, he's, I know Tim thinks he's hot. Uh, <laughs> I, well, you know, I don't think his choices are good, but you know. Yeah. Well, and I just want to tell listeners, we are on a Zoom and, and Melanie's camera is off, but I have seen posts on Facebook and Melanie looks incredible and amazing. Aww. So I just want to put that out there. I want it to not sound like we're not saying it yeah, back. Not- we just can't <laughs> see her right now. It's not like, oh, thanks, Melanie, and whatever. No, we are not seeing her right now, but it, you see Yeah, but Facebook. tell them why. I mean, I, I don't have the camera off because I'm ashamed. No. Oh, no. Um, I guess Melanie is a new Zoom user. Is this your yes. first Zoom? Yes. Yay. No way. We are yes. so honored. Yeah. My Very first honored. Zoom. Yes. Um, so, so, you know, moving through what, so getting to Friday the 13th, um, what was going on in your life? Like around the time that you auditioned, were you, you, how long had you been in LA and how did you hear about the audition for Friday the 13th? I had been in LA. Let me think probably three years. I had a great agent who um, got me out for a lot of good stuff. I had just done a feature month, a few months before I had done Friday. Um, and it was a Canon film, not the best stuff. It was called Thunder Alley. <laughs> and that was a big role for me. I got to play a heroin addict. Um, and it was uh, my kind of thing. I love the drama. Yeah, that is serious. Yeah, it was a very, very serious role. And I ended up killing uh, my love interest in that movie by shooting him up. So, yeah. So I had done that. And then um, my agent had sent me on an audition. Didn't tell me it was Friday the 13th. She just said, you're going to meet Fern Champion, who was the casting director. So I went in and it was a series. And it was pretty quick, actually. That audition was the first one. And then they brought me right back. When I went back the second time, they told me it was a horror film. I believe they told me it was Friday the 13th, but it meant nothing to me because I had never seen one. Oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, when I walked into the audition, there was a panel of faces. It was Frank Mancuso Jr. Ooh, the hottie. Yeah. <laughs> whose father was the head of Paramount at yeah. the time. Uh, it was the casting people, Danny Steinman. Mm-hmm. And they were sitting at this long table and I walked in, it was not a very large room. And uh, we met, talked a little bit. And then they said, well, we'd like you to improv that you're being murdered. Oh, Jesus. Go. <laughs> so I exited the room and they're shocked because I figured I'll come in, you know, I'm not just gonna start. So I exited the room, I walked back, I kicked the door open and I went into a scene that I was being chased and mauled and I ended up the end of this scene on the floor, I remember I was on the floor, hysterical, huddled in the corner. And when I finished, I looked at the table of the faces looking at me and their jaws were all on the floor. So I thought to myself, well, I either got this or they think I'm crazy. <laughs> and you'll, of course, be reenacting this for us yeah. right now, right? <laughs> and action. Ready, Melody? I want you to leave the room. Can you imagine? Oh, my God. I feel like, wow. I can't even. I'm trying to picture in my mind how intense that must have been. And uh, but a lot I'm sorry. of screaming, yeah. a lot of quiet. Lot, they were dead quiet. It was a lot of screaming and crying and throwing uh, things on my part. But I remember ending up in the corner of the room against the back wall. And then when I finished, I looked up and I think Danny was smiling because he was kind of a creep, but the rest (laughs) of them had their faces just, Frank Mancuso's jaw was, and then all he had to say to me was when I finished, I picked myself up from the heap on the floor. And he said to me, you know, I really need you to wash your face and take off all your makeup. I said, okay. So I had to go into the, to the, buildings horrible you know what those bathrooms are like yeah and <laughs> not fancy no and the only soap was in that dispenser those Jeez. things with that i washed my face with that stuff oh, wait, wait I, i'm confused he just wanted to see what you looked like without makeup I, or was it i i think i think he thought a i had too much makeup on for the role 
but I didn't, they didn't give me any description of the role. So I went in like myself. Yeah. Well, during the audition, did you like cry it all off or like? Well, I think some of it had gotten kind of messed up, but I think ultimately after the whole thing, the casting had said to me on the set one day that Frank wanted to see me without any makeup because he thought I had too much on. So, because I like makeup. So (laughs) I, I did that horrible dispenser thing i'm washing my face thinking boy i must really want this role because <laughs> this stuff is like borax <laughs> you know what I mean? so um i walked back in the room with the makeup off and i thought well i'm either really ugly or i'm going to get this role <laughs> and uh he smiled and the uh, they talked to me briefly and i left and they called me usually you have to wait a day or two mm-hmm. sometimes like for the best of the best i had to wait oh I had 15 callbacks and it was like weeks before I knew I got the role. Anyway, I got home. I was probably home an hour and a half and I got a phone call from my agent and she said, the casting have called us. We're really not supposed to tell you, you're not supposed to do this yet, but you got the role. Wow. Oh. And you said that you didn't know specifically which role it was or that, I mean, meaning I guess I'm. No, I knew what it was. I oh. knew what it was. I hadn't had a script, but I had the, the breakdown and I had uh, side, as they call sides. And so I knew uh, not in depth, but I knew who she was. Okay. I didn't know the concept of Final Girl. I didn't know horror films. Anyway, when I got the role, I immediately contacted Paramount and said, I need to see some of Friday the 13th. Perhaps I should see the latest one. They said that would be part four. So they got me a copy. And did you know, because you said you didn't weren't familiar with Final Girl, but, so they, but they had told you this is the survivor of the movie no, or one of the people? No, 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 no. I knew nothing. I knew I was playing a psychiatrist for these nutty kids. <laughs> and um, when I got the script, which they make you sign an NDA, mm. I got the script and read it and I went, yippee, I'm until the end. That's all I thought about was, wow, I'm in the last scene. I still didn't understand the concept of final girl. I just thought the story was, gee, all these people died but me. I wow. didn't know it had any kind of message or survivor or, you know, till That's I a- actually got on the set and was doing it. Then you learn, oh, wow. Oh my, and this so when you, so, so Friday the 13th part four was the first time you had watched the Friday the 13th movie? Yes, and uh, Kimberly Beck and I had the same agent. So oh, I, some, I somehow knew Kimberly just from seeing her at the office or something. I didn't personally know her, but we, we had met a few times and I really liked her. So I saw the film and I was shocked because I don't really like horror films. <laughs> and I thought, okay, well, mine probably won't be as bad. Oh. Not violent. Mine won't be as violent. I'm thinking this. <laughs> because on paper in the script they gave me, they didn't go into great detail of the kills. Yeah, yeah. It was more, I had a lot more dialogue than the feature also, by the way. The character was more meshed out, you know, flushed out. And Pam was more of a, a full bodied person. And in the final film, it's all about really killing and running. All I'm doing is running and screaming and throwing out a few platitudes like run, Tommy, run. <laughs> <laughs> I love, you're like, that should be the summary on IMDb. Well, actually. Uh, Melanie Kinnaman runs. No, I, you know, I wait, you were going to ask. I was just but she say- was much more of a character. I want you to know she had a lot more going on and I added a lot. But of course, I understand when I saw the, the final film at the uh, cast and crew screening, I was devastated because all I saw was me running in bad clothing and screaming. Now you have made no secret about your wardrobe and your food. Ah. Like um, we we watched the um, Friday 13 part five, a new beginning with you talking. The audio commentary. There's, <laughs> there's one really funny moment where there's kind of a pause between you and the other ladies. And I think the other ladies were T- Deborah Sue Voorhees and Tiffany Helm. Is that mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. And-, and you said, this is so funny. Matt and I were watching it, you know, in preparation. Mm-hmm. And uh, you said out of nowhere, you go, hideous. You were talking about your hair and it was hilarious. <laughs> but Melanie, the best part is the other ladies are like, no, no, you look great, Melanie. And you're like, oh, hideous. Please. Hideous. Well, I, well I, okay. Hideous. I, I, well, first off, I just want to let they you have know. made my hair worse? And <laughs> I, could, I swear to people who are listening to this, my hair was not ugly like that. <laughs> and my makeup was not that bad. 
I, I do want to just chime in and say, like, I know that, you know, you your thoughts on the, the movie, but like we as fans saw you as a strong, you know, um, um, fighter and just, uh, you know, I, I as a very respectable character and you're very well known in the series and we love you and so many people love you and your part in this series. So I just want to make sure you know that even the final product, like people just think that you are such an, an enduring great character. It's a, it's so, a classic, I'm happy like, for that. I'm like, happy for that because that's what I wanted people to feel. That was what I was bringing to the character was um, I was trying to have you see the strength and the the survivor in me? Yeah. So I'm glad that that came through. All the it other definitely absolutely. absolutely. And 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 just like with Kimberly Beck in um part four, when she's always looking out for Tommy, you know, um, you're looking out for others before, and that that makes I think a good character because there's so many selfish people in horror movies. You know, yeah. they're not looking out for anyone but themselves. Because you know, like Shavar, every man for himself. He runs off. Shavar, he leaves yeah. you. Yeah. Granted, <laughs> yes. he, granted, he was 11 or 12. I don't remember how old he was, but but you know what? He looked at me and like, I'm out of here. It's every man for himself. <laughs> totally. Uh, you know, a couple things before we get into like the meat of the film is when you did get the script, was it always the plan from the beginning that the killer was not going to actually be Jason, that it was going to be a copy guy? Because I've always wondered if that was the plan from the very beginning. Yes, 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 yes. Which meant nothing to me because again, I didn't know the franchise. Even oh. in part, have even having seen part four, I did not know the magnitude of the of the importance of Jason. I mm -hmm. thought it was just for that film, part four. Oh. So and, and I Jason, Jason is in you know he is in it in dream sequences yes. and flashbacks. Yes. But the cool thing about your movie is that it's a who done it. Like when I was growing up, I remember I watched it with my mom and my brother, and the whole time we're like, who is the killer? Who is the killer? So it does have a refreshing take on, you know, the rest of the series. So I thought so. Yeah. I thought they I thought they tried to do something different. So, you know, there's a there's a courage in that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's a risk. And you know, people I know I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again. People, when they go to McDonald's, they want a Big Mac. They don't want to try something yeah. new. <laughs> you know what? Oh, that, that is really funny. <laughs> I totally wouldn't think about it that way. I would say Chicken McNuggets. Though. Well, I mean, me too. Nuggets. Yeah. Well, so another question I wanted to ask, Melanie, that I know that you've, you've talked about before, but I wanted to get your take or Happy Horror Times take is, so working with the director, Danny Steinman, I know over the years, you know, I've, I've read and heard con tons of conflicting accounts from a lot of cast members and stuff. But so set the record straight for us. What was your experience like working with the director? <laughs> uh, and you could be as honest as you feel comfortable being. <laughs> well, yeah, because people have people have stopped hating me for that because he, he was so idolized. I don't really know why. I'm sure he was a wonderful man and I'm sure he was good to a lot of people in this film you know i'm not i'm not negating their account of their experience with him my experience was completely different mm -hmm. from the very first day wow so which is why i was shocked i did see him many years later at a convention a horror uh, no monster mania and i was afraid to see him and he was across the room from me and he kept looking at me and he he walked over to me and he said, I wanted to come over and say hello, how much you meant to me on this film, uh, what you brought to this film. I think you are extremely talented and very beautiful. And it was a great experience for me. So that broke the ice and we had an okay weekend. But his attitude towards me on the film was the complete opposite of what he had said to me. Wow. In 2011, I think it was. Um, Did you know what was good for me in this experience, though, was it made me a stronger person. Mm -hmm. It was my very first uh, lead in a, listen, it was a Paramount film. Whatever you think of the quality of the film, it was a Paramount Pictures movie, you know. Yeah. yeah. So it was across a, America. Oh, and it was, uh, it was a studio film, and it was my first lead. So I walked on that set prepared, hoping for support. You know, because as a theater actress, you get a lot of support from directors, producers, et cetera, and other cast. So when I got on the set, I had to do the first scene, which is ironically the very first scene of the film when you see me. Mm -hmm. And um, 
prior to that, they had put, I, I've told this before, they, the, the, the wardrobe people came in and put all the hideous uh, jewelry on me that did not, number one, did not go with the character. She would not have worn that stuff, especially in a loony bin. And, <laughs> and also it didn't go with the outfit. So I said to her very nicely, she was a young girl. I said, I don't want to wear this jewelry. Uh, it, and I explained to her why. And she said, well, you have to wear it. <laughs> I said, no, I don't. She, yes, you do. So I left my dressing room. It was a trailer and I looked for Danny. He did stick, stick it was the one and only time he stuck up for me. I walked up to him and I said, here's the situation. And he looked at the wardrobe lady and, and, and I said, I showed him the jewelry and I said, Danny, and he said, you're right. Oh. Take the jewelry off. You don't have to wear it. You're a therapist, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. You're oh, you. This jewelry was ridiculous. Hideous. Hideous. <laughs> She's trying. <laughs> I want a hideous. hideous. Yeah. I need some Melanie Kidman hideous. No, it was. It was hideous, and it was giant, <laughs> as big as the freaking pants I was wearing. So anyway, after that, we went downhill because everything I needed from Danny, I didn't get. But in hindsight that made me a better actor because yeah. I had to do it alone. If I asked him a question in that office scene was very difficult for me. The very first, I walk through, take Tommy in and we go in the office and I'm there with Matt. Mm -hmm. It's a very simple scene for what you're seeing, but it was the most difficult scene I had ever done because Danny was working against me. So mm -hmm. I said, what, what do you want me to do in this scene? Meaning what, what, am I trying to project to this new kid that's here? And he said, whatever you want to do. <laughs> You're like, and okay, I, as you, you start yeah. juggling. So I, and do so I took a moment and I said to myself, just go for it. You know, that, that one particular scene, it was, was difficult for me. And there is another time later in the film where I have a scene with Tommy in the hospital where he's having the dream and he stabs me. That was yeah. a dream. When I first come in to see him and Danny, we started a roll. I come in, I'm crying. I open the door, we walk in. I'm standing over his, his body there. And Danny said, cut. You're taking too long to cry. Oh. I said, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just, I've been through all this stuff. And now I'm seeing him for the first time. He said, just get to it. <sighs> <laughs> a real actor's director. <laughs> well, I, I mean, look, I will say this. It, it sounds, number one, it doesn't show on the film at all that any, you know, obviously any struggles. Not that it would, because we're not seeing that. But I'm saying is that we obviously see the film and, and appreciate it's yeah. great. And I will say it sounds like if maybe you guys kind of buried the hatchet at the end, yeah. especially before he passed away, that's at least a yeah. Way. You know, a lot of times it takes a long time for people to reflect back on things and say, hey, maybe I could have done that a little well, differently. I mean, the, I don't know Danny Steinman. And, you know, and I'm I, sure he was a wonderful guy. Yeah, I'm not absolutely. I'm not saying anything. I'm just trying to express my experience, which in the end served me well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because everything you see there, I worked on and put it out there. Good or bad. That was all me. Yeah. And it's and 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 like I said, that's testament to you as an actress, testament to the character that you've established in this series that has lasted so long and has so many fans and things. And especially if you had a tougher time with the director, putting that into the character yourself is pretty admirable, you know? Yeah. And I do know that a lot of fans don't like the film. They don't like the character. They've made it very clear, and that's fine. Not everybody's gonna like you. They've made it very clear that it's their least favorite film because Jason's not in it. And my argument is, well, in my mind, Jason wasn't it, you know, who yeah, was yeah. Just <laughs> he inspired a man to kill everyone. So yeah. Jason. Was yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I mean, I guess moving on to some of the other people that we had mentioned that you worked with, um, Shavar Ross and John Shepard, what was it like? I mean, I know those are the two other, um, leads yeah. in the movies. What was it like working with them? What was your relationship with them? Any stories from filming with both of them? Uh, they were both a dream to work with. They were fantastic. They were professional. Uh, Shavar, of course, was a veteran. I didn't know that. He had done so much work since he was, I think, six or seven years old. Wow. So he was a, a very easy. John Shepard was also very easy to work with because he was very professional. He was very distant. Um, 
which he told me much later that it was his way of being able to play that character. And one day, I think it was very early, uh, probably my first week, I had come in and brought flowers. I put flowers in John Shepard's trailer, which was right next to mine. I gone to the florist and I got flowers for the hair and makeup people because I know who to bribe. Yeah. <laughs> they, those were my first buddies and you know what. Yeah. And then, um, and, and, I, and for John. And John and I had no interaction, but I heard him go into his trailer. And about five minutes later, there was a knock on my trailer door and I opened it up and he jumped in and hugged me so hard. And he said, thank you so much. It really made me feel great, the card that you wrote. And that was the last time we had any kind of physical, but he squeezed me so tight and he was so happy. And then he went back into his trailer. And from that moment on, we had no interaction other than who we were as characters. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, that's cool. And yeah, I mean, I guess um, I'm trying to think other than Corey Feldman in part four, there really hadn't been any kids in these movies mm -hmm. that I'd, no. I, and I'm glad obviously that he survived, even though he did sort of look out just for himself, but. <laughs> yeah. um, well, they don't um, kill, I don't think they kill kids in the, in these in the uh, I, Hopefully not. No, I don't think they kill kids in Friday the 13th. I no, think yeah. you have to be over 18 or something. You yeah. got to be over 18 to die. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, another thing that we wanted to touch on that I know you've touched on a ton of times, but again, we uh, it's big topics for us is, and your favorite topic, the sweater. Uh, <laughs> so, okay, so here's hideous. my question. I know, hideous though. So here's my question. Did they just, oh, actually, in case you didn't notice, there's a part where Melanie is running through the rain, screaming she's being chased by the killer and in different scenes she has a sweater wrapped around her and in other parts she doesn't and I know Melanie you've talked a lot about this but um my question for you is did they just film a ton of takes during that scene some with the sweater on some without and then the editor just didn't check that it connected like how did that happen correct correct <laughs> uh, it was a uh, two days of running in the rain in the was freezing. It was in the woods in um, October, 30, right? October. It was 30 degrees at night. And uh, we were shooting two, three, four in the morning. But we did uh, many, many hours of the, the running sequence. And first of all, I had suggested that she wouldn't have the sweater on <laughs> anyway at that <laughs> point. And when you're running, you're getting rid of all this stuff that's hanging on you because you have to have traction and speed. True. So I, and I, my logic also was, I said, Danny, shouldn't she have lost the sweater by now in the beginning of this? Just leave the sweater on. So anyway, that, that, that would have alleviated all of that if the sweater was taken off at the beginning of the running sequence, which is logical. Am I wrong? Did you get to pick the rest of your outfit? No, I didn't get to pick anything. Did he, did he purposely want you in white when knowing it was raining? I'm just wondering. Yes. Like, did he, <laughs> well, I also questioned that because I was the last person to know that you could see through it. And the makeup artist who was a good friend of mine, Lou, Lou Lazara, great makeup artist, he said to me, hey, by the way, you know, they can see through the shirt. I said, really? I, I had a feeling because it's wet. He said, yeah, I, I think it's intentional. So I said, Danny, um, should I put a bra on? Hell no. I said, the, I, they can see through the shirt. He said, that's the idea. Just keep running. Oh, wow. Uh, and you know, it's funny because it's such a white shirt that like- And then he yelled, like, this hose her down. Hose her down. She's not wet enough. <laughs> oh, so no. They hosed no. Me no, no, they hosed me down with a hose. Well, I mean, it is true, right, that he formerly directed porn, correct? I didn't know any of this. I like <laughs> right. the last one to this party. No, I found no, all this stuff no, out no. 10 years ago. Wow. It, it's just so fun. Hose her down. Wow. And, and it's funny hose her down. <laughs> you wouldn't expect. Um, here's the thing. I would totally think that for But like the final girl survivor, you wouldn't expect that like the director would be saying hose her down. Like, let's see through her <laughs> shirt. But, you know, e either way, get, getting back. So with the sweater. So they made you film some parts with it, um, holding it in other parts where you just said, fuck it. I'm getting rid of it. No, I think it either. I, I got I, I really don't remember. I think it naturally fell off. Oh, or yeah. we understand it off or we took it off for some reason. But then they should have used only footage with the sweater off. Right. You know what I mean? 
No, it's it was mm-hmm. so much footage with the sweater on. But again, I had said, and again, I was a novice. I had said, isn't it best that this sweater is gone for the, all the running sequence? That's funny. They wanted you to have that preppy look, which I really appreciate. <laughs> Tim loves, Tim loves running with sweaters attached. I've got to say, well, you know, and I think I, heard, I don't know if it's the audio commentary, Melanie, or something else, but there was kind of like a feud between you and the editor because you spoke up about it and then he sp- responded or was there like a Hollywood yes. feud about this? I didn't know that again. I didn't know anything about that. Thank you, Daniel. Um, because he did the did the uh, Crystal Lake memories, mm-hmm. um, and so I understand for for excitement and drama, he set this up this way, but he didn't tell me. So when he interviewed me for Crystal Lake memories, uh, he asked the question about how I felt about that sweater coming and going. He already knew, and so I said, "You'd think that an editor for a Paramount." feature would pay attention that's all i said well he asked the editor the same question so daniel Farron says to the editor what i had said and then says go and he said well if she had been a better actress nobody would have no noticed the sweater coming and going because they would have been riveted on her and her acting. Cheap shot, <laughs> cheap shot and incorrect. Because incorrect. Like, I think you said this, Meryl Streep could have done that scene and you would have seen the sweater. Right? I believe so. I, I believe, believe so, so. I think it was such a gaping thing. You could, unless you there's something wrong with you, you can't miss it because it's, it's such a, it's a white, it's, it's a white, white shirt with a pink sweater on it. <laughs> I, I and the this- sweater's coming and going. And it's an ugly sweater. <laughs> well, I think it's beautiful. <laughs> Tim, Tim loves it. You I love a pink sweater. It. You always look like you're going to play tennis anyway. So yeah, that's, that's my does, favorite look. That is Tim's look. That's t- so true. His look. I, you know, I think it adds to the camp of the movie. And yeah. I say that in the totally positive manner. Like it's almost like one of those fun things you remember to look for, like an Easter egg. Yeah. You know? I know, but I wish it wasn't there. I really, yeah, I, I get it, it is. It is funny. Um, um, you know, I, I because know what I think, I know I could be wrong at this, but what I think it does is negate everything I've done in that film. Mm-hmm. I think that that sweater coming and going wipes out everything I did in that sequence in that running. I actually, never Shame. noticed until the documentary like really? I multiple multiple viewings of that movie and i never noticed it until it was brought to my attention by camp crystal lake memories me too i've got to admit wow and, and, well then i guess i'm wrong no, no. And, and if anything that speaks to exactly what yeah. the editor said like we were when you're watching that scene like we're watching someone who's terrified running for her life and you sold it really well yeah. i mean you and you it, run into the guy with the thing in his head the cute uh, one yeah i mean when the cute <laughs> one has a thing in his head and then doesn't poor shavar's grandpa get thrown yes. through the window but that's a di- right I mean, in front of me right yeah, in I, front of me oh by the way how many how many takes can you do that scene guess what <laughs> that was one take I bet. Wow. I nailed it. I'll tell you yeah. what. I knew I had to. I had to. It was all, by the way, uh, seamless, sle- seamless shot. In other words, they followed me with the camera and it went from outside to in- inside the room. It follows me as I'm making my way and he comes flying through the window. They could only break that once <laughs> and uh, or they would have had to set that whole thing up again. Yeah. And that was all done in one thing. And I was thrilled that they got it i really concentrated so hard on not screwing that up getting that right because they made it very clear to me your reaction is so genuine well they they made it clear to me if you don't get this right it's going to cost if if you don't get this right melanie the hose is coming out again (laughs) (laughs) um you know so and i know you've talked about this another thing also but again we're trying to ask questions that we we're thinking of when even hearing your audio commentary. But so I know the original plan after part five was to bring you, I think, um, um, John and Shavar back for part six, correct? Yes. Um, but then they scrapped the idea when they decided to bring Jason back. But here's my big question. So 
they they scrapped that idea and they decide to bring Jason back for part six and they bring back the part of Tommy Jarvis. So why couldn't they bring back the part of Pam also? Did you they ever were going to they were going to bring this is what I was told when I signed the contract for both features, by the way. I signed How for two, cool is that? Two I pictures. love that. Yeah. yeah, I had a two picture deal with that. So they we were supposed to start shooting like two months after. Mm-hmm. And they said that the script had changed, but still wanted Tommy and Pam. But John Shepard has refused because he's had a change of heart about these kind of films. Mm. So without John, we can't bring you. So it's going to be a whole new script and a whole new Tommy and a whole new thing. Wow. So I was devastated. Yeah. And it just seems like they're still I, I get maybe they figured, oh, it was the chemistry between John and Melanie as mm-hmm. it, but again, they still kept Tommy Jarvis. And it's like if we can buy into a different actor playing Tommy Jarvis, if anything, that would keep the continuity if they brought the same actress. I know. Pam. I know. I, I, it's weird to me what, what their idea was, but they decided to scrap the whole thing since they felt that they made a mistake getting rid of Jason and they wanted to just have you all forget about part five. And do a whole different part six. Well, I love part five and you're in it. And God bless you. you. See um, John Shepard workout shirtless. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, No, but he he, he walked around a lot with a six pack. Yeah, he he didn't work out a lot uh, in front of me, but he definitely walked around half naked. Did he not, was it, he became really religious or did he just decided that horror wasn't like, I mean, I guess I'm wondering what made that change of heart between the two movies? Like what changed, you know? I don't know. I just know he is very active in the Christian community and he does, Mm -hmm. he's a producer for Christian films. But you've seen him at a convention, right? Like, I mean, like, have you crossed paths with so many kind of embraces it a little more? No. Oh, really? No, I thought, no, I saw him at the convention. We did one together at uh, horror hound a few years ago. And, um, and we did, oh, we did Texas Frightmare also. So I did two with him and he remained the same, very aloof to the whole thing. He was very kind to the um, fans mm-hmm. and he seemed to embrace all of that. But there was a part of him that was um, con- conflicted. Yeah, I felt I felt. Yeah. Wow. You know, when you guys were done filming and everything was um, finished, was there a, uh, a red carpet premiere? I, or that's what? my favorite question. <laughs> I, I mean, asked did, that the, to did the casting yes. crew all come and see? And what was that like? We first we had a casting crew screening at Paramount. Awesome. And that was right after before the film was released. But then there was a big premiere in Westwood at that Bruin, that beautiful theater in Westwood Village. Yes. Beautiful. Yes, 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 carpet. Yes. yes, they did the whole thing, red carpet. And the cast and crew um, were upstairs in the balcony. And my mother flew in and my sister, we all had friends and family there. And I had organized an after uh, red carpet film feature, you know, the um, premiere, I had organized a dinner for us to all get together and have dinner. So it was a casting crew. It was a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, seeing the film, the thrill of it was for me that my mother came in from Holyoke, Massachusetts, and she was sitting right next to me. And the, the, the uh, curtain came up and you just heard the music and the audience went crazy. And my beautiful score. (laughs) My mother looked at me and said, wow, this is a big deal. (laughs) <laughs> and then my name came up on the screen and she looked at me and she said, now I believe it. Oh, so that was worth it for me. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's amazing. And, and for me, it was shocking to see the reaction of the audience. I did not know this, that this franchise was that beloved. So uh, that was exciting for me. Yeah. And that's, that's what I was going to ask you. Was that when you, because when did it first click how big this franchise was and how big the fandom was? Was it right when the movie came out? Was it not till you started doing conventions? No, or like it when was, did it finally register? It was at the premiere, the red carpet premiere, because the owner of the theater was there. And also on, um, a reporter from Variety. And they interviewed me there on the red carpet. And I thought, wow, this is kind of a big deal. <laughs> and they, then the next day, that same reporter from Variety called me. And he said, well, congratulations. 
your film has grossed the uh, fifty million dollars in the weekend, the opening weekend. And oh. I said, "Is that a big deal?" He said, "It's the biggest grossing horror film of that franchise." So then I realized it was it was a big deal that it was very popular. Wow! And I would get stopped on the street and stuff uh, cool. at the grocery store, at, you know, at the gas station, and and the fans would come out from nowhere. And I thought, "This is a this is a big deal." I had no oh. idea. And that's amazing. Do you um are do you keep in touch with any of the cast or crew members? Um um, yeah. I know yeah. you said you saw John Shepard at the conventions. Or is it just at conventions? Do you other cast members that you keep? In no, touch I'm with? very close with Shavar Ross. I see him. Um, oddly enough, I I stay in touch with John Dixon. You remember Eddie? Yeah, the yeah. hottie. Yes. Yeah, I'm fr I'm friends, and I stay in touch with John Dixon. I know what's going on with him and all that stuff. So it's kind of nice. We, we stay in touch. Good choice but, to be in a buddy with. <laughs> Tim's like, and do you make them work out shirtless in front of you? <laughs> Listen, I just need to know the facts. Yeah. <laughs> Have you met the other final girls at any of the conventions? Like the other yes. Friday 13th? Yes, final all girls? of them. There were there was a big reunion at, at Monster Mania, and the uh, very first convention I did. And I met all of them, all of them. Man, it was it, they were all very nice and that was nice and then i did another one there's a picture out there somewhere of me and uh, adrian and amy dana and, yep dana a bunch of us so yeah it was my first time meeting them that's so cool I, it's like being part of an elite club you know <laughs> yeah dare i say something controversial Please. I, I call them the final bitches because there are a certain number of them that treat me like um the uninvited Oh, really? How come? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Oh, and it's, I was... been, it's been ongoing. So that because I'm not the Jason girl. And so they've kind of treated me at the last couple of conventions like the outsider. Now I find it amusing, but I call them the final bitches. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. I have to say, though, let me clarify. Amy, Amy has been very nice to me. Uh, Adrian, you know, there are a few of them that have been. But for the most part, yeah. It's a running joke with people that know me well. The final bitches. The final bitches. It's funny, but I mean, you, you, the title well, has Friday. No, they will take pictures. There will be a group picture taken at a convention, but I'm left out. And I'm standing right there, but I'm off to the side. You say, hey, I'm Roy's girls. Is, <laughs> I guess so. So they should take a shot of me alone. I'm Roy's it, girl. That's so funny. That's right. I did. I didn't think that seems like high school. I mean, the title does yeah, have Friday the 13th in it. The killer yeah. is wearing the music, a, everything. A hockey mess. You wow. Got well, you know, uh, a couple more questions and then we'll um, let you yes. return to your afternoon. Um, um, what, so when you go to conventions or when people approach you, what's the most common question or comment you get? Or what's about the number one thing you sign? The, all oh, of them. well, both of those. All of them. No, all no, yeah, them. both things. Most well, first, I, I sign the mask a lot. I sign the, the big poster. I sign a lot of things with me with the chainsaw. Of course. Um, uh, I, I love getting the foreign posters, things from all over the world that you haven't seen. The artwork is amazing. Oh, the Italian one. They have some girl that's not even me lying on the ground with Jason standing that. over her. Hey, isn't it, it's not even me. It's bizarre. But they, it's but it's I said, OK. And then there's one where there's a poster. It's 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 supposed to be me. Thank God. She, this girl's gorgeous. She's a, <laughs> some gorgeous model and she's on the ground and they don't even have my name. They have her name. What? Yeah. <laughs> I got to get a copy of that. Yeah. Oh it's somebody I said when the guy handed it to me to sign, I said, who's this girl? He went, I don't know. <laughs> I, signed, I should have signed her name. Melanie, wow. you are so funny. I well, love that you look back on all this and just like, whatever. Yeah, well, and then, and what do, what's the most common thing like fans come up and either tell you or ask you about the movie? Um, they, you know, the best part is they will tell me how it affected their life. Oh. Not the movie, but, but my character, which always shocks me. I've gotten stories, some people that said they were abused as children and, I mean, heart wrenching things. And they tell me how they would watch that film and it got them through being bullied in school or, awesome. or, or uh, abused at home. Yeah. So some of those stories are shocking to me and they make me feel really good that somebody got something good out of that film. Yeah, because you're a fighter. Yes, yeah. exactly. And it is good. Yeah, it's heartwarming. Shocking. And the questions they ask me uh, the most common is what was it like to uh, work the chainsaw? 
<laughs> what was it like to be running in the rain? Was it cold? Was it real rain? I said, no, it was machines. By the way, those machines, they're much colder than real water. I they're understand. heavier because they're filled with silicone, which I didn't know it's water and silicone and it sticks to you. Oh. And the droplets are very heavy. Oof. They yeah. looked real. That is, that I mean, is they rough. They're machines. They're machines. They're giant machines they install. It was fascinating. And it rained buckets of rain, but that it was machines. Yeah. So like the, everything must have been like, whenever they said action, just like everything must have been soaked or like soaked. The puddles everywhere. Soaked puddles everywhere. One girl said, uh, what was it like to run in those boots? Nothing for me. I've been wearing high heels since I was five. So. <laughs> You're like easy. Easy. Nothing. Yeah. Well, um, so we just have two more questions for you. Okay. One is, um, and we asked it to everyone we interview, but what is one thing that you can tell us about your experience on Friday the 13th part five that you've never told any other interviewer, publication, podcaster, any little detail or anything you can tell us that you've never told anyone? Oh, wow. <laughs> Oh, I thought I was going to take this stuff to my grave. <laughs> oh, <laughs> even the littlest tiny yeah, thing. Yeah, it could just be like, you know, on the third day of filming, we had chicken. We <laughs> could be like that. No, Any, that's anything no you good. Can do. Uh, oh, I don't know, because some people are going to hear this. Uh, <laughs> that's right. We have one million no, listeners. No. <laughs> we are a, a developing podcast, but yeah, anything you can tell us or feel comfortable about telling Marco us. Marco St. John hit on me in my trailer. Ooh, that's a good one. Really? You tell tell wanna, us more. You might want, oh, you might want to edit that. Well, <laughs> we can, whatever you want, Melanie. Wait, wait. No, that's okay. I guess you okay. can leave that in. If he hears it, he'll yell at me, but. Oh, right. he hit on you in your trailer. Was he like, yeah. knock, knock, hello? Was he like, uh, yeah. hey, I saw that uh, white shirt after the rain <laughs> scene. No, no, he actually was very, very religious. Oh. And he said to me, I think you're a little bit more outgoing than you should be. Interesting. Who so thought there'd be all these religious men on a horror film? I know that is <laughs> funny. Could pull it back a little bit, but then he uh, proceeded to hit on me. So. Oh, my, hey, that's and flattering. I, I know that it. is flattering. And then the other last question we the have: Sheriff was a lech. Oh, oh, the one with the hair. That's Marco St. John, the sheriff. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. Just making sure. Oh, <laughs> the one with the hair, yeah. And then the other question is, if the powers that be ever wanted to bring Pam back for a Friday the 13th movie, uh, would you be up for reprising the role? Absolutely, just with better hair and no jewelry. Oh, uh, <laughs> Melanie, you're hilarious. Better hair. No, but it is really cool to be a survivor of a movie and like know that your character is still alive like any day. That's right. Like, Decide. And because they didn't bring me back for part six, those bitches, I'm still alive. <laughs> I'm They're... still alive. I'm now, the only one of those girls that's still yeah. around. Thank you very much. Yeah. Now, if they did a movie called Final Bitches, would you be? <laughs> I could. Uh, Dana could be the lead one. Oh! <laughs> oh I'm, I'm coughing. I'm laughing so hard. Oh my god! And you can tell. And you can tell Peter M. Bracky M. Oh, for. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that he told me that it was his least favorite Friday part five is his least favorite of the franchise. But Peter Bracky like, said that. Yes, he did. What a punk ass bitch. But, but you know, we're actually, <laughs> we're actually good friends. But you know what? Even so I would friends. say knowing Peter, even what is his least favorite, he probably still loved. No, <laughs> he, is, he is such he a fan it. of the series. No, he told me this in his house, by the way, sitting on his couch. And he said, no, it's my least favorite, but I love Why you. Why would he say that? No, I, I, love think, him. I, I think I asked him. I think I asked him. I said, because he's so into the franchise and he has his favorites. And I said, oh, yeah. you, you, I said, what did you think about part, part five? Because I knew he was going to say this. He said, well, I didn't really like it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I've just got to say, Melanie, we loved it. We, we love, love it. you. You have been so amazing. This interview has been yes. so much fun and we are so grateful. Thank you so much for taking the time seriously. Thank you for inviting me and being so handsome. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess you'll have to talk to our parents about that. <laughs> no, no, well, thank you for being so incredible and for being a good friend, for keeping up with us. We will um, keep you updated on when we are going to release okay. this episode and we'll send you the link and um, okay. and everything. But thank you so much for taking yeah. the time today. Seriously. And the, when the pandemic is over, we'll all go out again. Yes. We definitely will. Yes. I can't wait. All right. Thanks. Okay. Again, well, guys. take care. Have a good afternoon. Bye, okay. Bye. Bye.
We hope you enjoyed this episode of Happy Horror Time. We are so happy you've taken the time to check out our podcast. This podcast is hosted by Matt Emmer and myself, Tim Murdoch. It's co-produced by Jacob Randall. You can find Happy Horror Time on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, Happy TV, and many other streaming platforms. If you'd like to stay updated, please like and follow Happy Horror Time podcast page on Facebook. You can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Happy Horror Time. And if you'd like to contact us, send us an email at happyhorrortime at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your thoughts, your movie recommendations, and any horror celebrities you'd like us to interview. To support the podcast, please visit patreon.com slash happyhorrortime and sign up to be a patron. That'll give you access to our growing library of bonus episodes. Our goal is to release at least one bonus episode per month. Before we go, we'd like to recommend a podcast hosted by our co-producer, Jacob Randall. It's a true crime podcast called Crime of Your Life, in which Jacob takes a look at unsolved criminal cases and other mysteries while examining the true crime genre itself. It's incredibly engaging, and we definitely recommend it. I'm Tim Murdoch. And I'm Matt Emmert. And thanks thanks again again for listening to Happy Horror Time. Time.